Let's try that again. Rebel Force Radio presents Experimental Unit. Production values. Of course, top notch production level here. Yeah, you try it. Here we go. Rebel Force Radio presents Experimental Unit Clone Force 99. The defective clones with the desirable mutations. They call themselves the Bad Batch. The Bad Batch. This is the Bad Batch. After Show. After Show. All right, welcome back. Bad Batch After Show. I think this officially marks... I think we can officially say this is the halfway point of the third and final season of the Bad Batch. Bad Territory. Seems fitting. It seems like a fitting title for the Bad Batch. Bad Territory. And I got to say, you know, I was looking for, as we've been talking about on the show, looking for the momentum to slow down, looking for the the focus to maybe get a little scattershot. And I still feel, even though they are kind of in that mode of, Got to get this in order to get that, and then got to get this to then get that and put it all together. I still feel that the time we're taking to get there, and I think a lot of us have an idea of what there is, which is this siege on Tantus. That's what we're all waiting for. Uh, I think along the way, we're doing some really great character development. That's been a huge part of this season, and I'm there for it. I The show flies by for me. And I'm enjoying every bit of it. And I hope you are too. Well, I'm sure you are if you're here hanging out with us on the Bad Batch After Show from Rebel Force Radio. We're looking at each and every episode of the series. We've done it with all the Disney Plus series. We've done it going all the way back to the Clone Wars and the Clone Wars movie many, many years ago. So uh, if you um, are new to some of those shows, you might want to check out those after shows because they are a good time. We're going to have a good time tonight. By we, I mean, if you're new to the program, introductions in order. My name is Jason, and with me, as always, my good friend and yours from Chicago, Jimmy Mack. Hey, Jason. Hey, Star Wars fans. Back for more Batch. Wow, this is, a, you know, a really strong season, I think. Um, the sights, the sounds, the story. Well, I shouldn't say the sights, because you can barely see anything happening on screen. It's, Another ridiculously oh, dark episode. A Ladies and gentlemen, I, I have... we needed new TVs. Did you hear that? Yeah, you gotta buy new TVs. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Here, how, how do you like that? Let's let's <laughs> let's do the entire RFR. Uh, brought to you by the Bad Batch Lighting Guy. Here, here I am in the studio. I, I don't know if you can see me, but um, I've noticed because I went back and watched some uh, first season episodes today, and. Uh, that was much better lit. <laughs> you could actually see things that were going on the screen. I, I mean, I get the the vibe they're trying to create, but um, y- you want to be able to see the show you're watching. And uh, this has been going on since, uh, I, I recall there was a Game of Thrones episode that everyone lit up the internet saying it was too dark, you couldn't see anything. Well, it seems like in the wake of that, a lot of things have been too dark and hard to see on screen. And uh, I I wonder who they're trying to impress with all of this. Um, Because a lot of work goes into the animation, and I think we should be able to see what's going on. Like I said, I went back and watched some first season stuff today and noticed that, uh, wow, you can can really, uh, the colors are popping. (laughs) There's a clarity to it. And then about midway through the second season, it started getting gradually darker and darker. And pretty soon, I think by the season finale, we'll be looking at nothing but a dark screen the whole time and just hearing the, uh, 
the actual episode instead of actually seeing it. There you go. <laughs> All right, Max covered the entire camera. Yeah. Uh, well, it's look here. It's it's true because I take uh, screen grabs to uh, you know help the the, the conversation, and they're dark, and uh, and I'm mm -hmm. creating thumbnails, and I have to just crank up the brightness on some of these to so you can actually see what character. We're trying to show, so I'm I'm aware of of HDR and and all of that, but at the same time, HDR is supposed to be something that, if you're a real cinephile and you're out and you're 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 buying 4K discs and you want to have that that kind of setup and it's supposed to add, it's not supposed to take away. That's my point. These features are not supposed to take away, and it seems like uh, HDR. No, the show's just too dark. <laughs> I mean, I just. I think that there's so much excitement and adventure going on each and every week. These battles, especially the end battle in this episode when they're fighting that um, the uh, praying mantis, and you couldn't see it. You couldn't see it, and that's effective for a little bit. Like oh, you know, like X Files, it builds up the expectation, or we're working around our budget. But they don't need to do that the whole time. That whole sequence, once the sun went down in the Everglades there on that planet, you couldn't see a darn thing. Can't see a thing, but it didn't it's make just me not enjoy it. It's an observation. Mm -hmm. I, I I shouldn't have have uh, complained so much because my uh, trying to make a point by covering up my camera has given me like some really blurry footage now. So <laughs> it's the tech gods. It's like Somewhere yeah, Joel Aaron my... heard about you uh, complaining about the lighting. <laughs> hey, Joel is uh, he is one of the responsible parties here. And uh, Joe is he on very... vacation? Has he been on vacation the last couple of episodes? Yeah, what's up with that? I mean, Joel really does know how to light a scene in animation. Yes. But there's there's not much light to be shine on this, on these characters or anything. It's it's just total darkness. So yeah, I, th I think they'll they, they'll only uh, they only believe they'll be able to impress us if it's just a blank screen, and uh, you're just hearing it. You're not even seeing it. So yeah. yeah, and be that between that and the way they mix things nowadays, where you can't understand the dialogue. I mean, and they're wondering why people aren't going out to the movies anymore. Come on, <laughs> you know the the Batman the animated series was actually drawn on black paper because they wanted Gotham to feel very very dark. I could see that much better than I can see the Bad Batch, and it's supposed to be dark, but y yeah. you want to see stuff too. And that was talk about needing a shadowy seedy looking um looking uh, setting for the for for our characters but anyway well, let's talk about what we liked about this episode and by episode i mean season three episode eight the tale of the tape here bad territory directed by nate villanueva and written by matt mcnovitz and uh, story editor of course matt mcnovitz uh, this episode clocks in about 24 uh, minutes 50 seconds an original air date for those of you watching or listening into the future, March 20th, 2024. So, yeah, a lot to like on this episode. I think that if I had to characterize this as, as something, it, to me, this was the episode where Crosshair is catching up. He's catching up and on, on the things that he, he missed out on. And he's, you start to see him getting sentimental about this. The first time... That we uh, we see this is in the uh, one of the first scenes where they talk about getting a transmission from Fee and Crosshair's like, oh, who's that? And Omega struggles to try to uh, characterize who Fee is, uh, liberator of antiquities or things, something like ancient wonders, and uh, she, she says, I oh, don't know, pirate. You know, she she's a pirate. So. Crosshair is in a situation, Jim, where he's always going to be a step or two behind everyone else. And he's probably, you know, he's certainly a guy just like the rest of the Badgers that pride himself on having the top, uh, you know, most up to date intel. He knows everything. He's a step or two ahead, but he's compromised physically and he's compromised in terms of his ability to know what's around the corner because he's in a world that has sort of passed him by in some ways. Well, excuse me. Very true. Very true. Um, at least we get some more information about this hand business of his. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, 
And uh, just by the way he reacts to uh, when he's asked about uh, what kind of experimentation did they do on you, he sort of storms out. Yeah, like uh, that's 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 something he doesn't he doesn't feel comfortable talking about right now. And so you you can draw the obvious connection to uh, the experimentation going on on him and the other clones in uh, Tantus has affected his hand some for some reason. But, uh, yeah, they keep dragging that one out. Um, well, they seem late. to have eliminated the possibility that this is anything physical. They're really right. leaning into this, that this is psychological. So all of the listeners and the folks in the chat and people that have been calling us saying that I, we really, I really think this is a psychological thing. It, it, it seems like they're probably right. This isn't any kind of a virus. This isn't any kind of... Uh, there was one call uh, I listened to a guy who was talking about a hand transplant. That was his theory. He thought <laughs> that, that Hemlock switched hands on Crosshair so he could have his powers. Uh, Maybe wow, that's a Hemlock good theory. gave him his hand. Right. And then Crosshair got, yeah, thinking Hemlock would probably be thinking, yeah, it makes him a better shot. Right. To right. have the clones oh, just had right hand. hand. Yeah, yeah, that's all, it, that's all you need. Just, just that you have to have hand, isn't it? Something George Costanza always wanted to have. You have, have to no, have hand. I have no hand. <laughs> that's, that's crosshair right now. Yeah, he has yeah. no hand. Um, so yeah, he he definitely doesn't want to relive what they did to him. And Az says, you know, if you were to elaborate more on the on the experimentation you were subjected to, maybe I could determine a cause. He walks out. You know, he's. He's kind of like the the veteran that doesn't want to tell the horror stories, doesn't want to tell the war yeah. stories. And question I have for you and everybody is, is it enough with what we actually saw Crosshair growth, go through, or should we be assuming that there were a lot of things that we didn't see on the show, other missions when he was, with, when he was in service to the Empire where he did some really, really bad things? Yeah, I think so. I, I I think he did. You know, I mean, we saw him in that one episode. I think it was when they went back to Ryloth, and uh, he was um, very much on board with the Empire. And I, I I think he has done things that have affected him in a way where he actually might be feeling some tinges of guilt, and he yeah. want to make good on that. Um, but yes, there are there are elements of Crosshair's story that we just haven't heard. Yeah, but there, on the flip side, there's some really positive signs. I mean, the fact that Hunter decided to let Omega stay with Uncle Crosshair there yeah. on Pabu. I mean, I I feel mm -hmm. like that was a big moment. I mean, that was, you know, not only did he tell Omega that she was going to stay there and he and Wrecker were going to go on the mission. He was going to stay there with Crosshair. He also was saying, Hey, while, while we're away, what, why don't you talk to him? See if you can get him to open up about this or um, get, uh, get his hand looked at somehow. And of course, then that's what leads to AZ taking a look at it. But I got the sense in that scene that AZ had seen, had looked at it before. Hmm. And I can't remember the line, but there was something that just made me think that he'd looked at it uh at another time and he's still not being able to determine, you know, what the, what the actual cause is, but nonetheless, trust might be, we could assume here between Hunter and Crosshair at a hundred percent. I mean, that's a big deal leaving Omega there with him. And also we, it, it might be a reflection of Omega's level of competency, at least in the eyes of Hunter, where he mm. figures, well, if Crosshair does try to pull anything fishy, Omega will be on it, and uh, she'll let us know right away, and she'll be able to handle herself with him until they got back. It could be some of that, too. Right. Yeah, well, she's definitely formidable. No question about that. And Crosshair's given her plenty of props uh, for her being, uh, you know, pretty pretty good in a scuffle and, and uh, coming in handy with all that. I did want to uh, – I, I, I threw this up here. Uh, or I, I grabbed this, you know, when they come into the space station and, uh, you don't see a lot of 
even though the, one of the most iconic lines is, you know, that's no sp- uh, that, that's no space station, uh, that's no moon, um, it's a space station. So we we see the Death Star is a space station. We don't see a lot of space stations though in in Star Wars, and this one, uh, where they go and they meet Fennec, I mean it's it's right out of Star Trek. <laughs> I looked at yep. this, and yep. I had to grab this capture. I think this is from uh, Wrath or uh, Search for Spock. It is just right, and it could be, you know, it's so on the nose here that it maybe it's a little homage, a little tip of the hat. But I will say, um, I'm not gonna say it took me out of the episode, but <laughs> I did, I did go. Oh, that looks like Star Trek. <laughs> so it sure does. Right yeah. away, I thought of that starship museum that they had in picard oh yeah which was a similar right. looking space station to this one it is very trek i uh I, I was feeling the same thing just like you so much i was like well haven't we seen something like this before in star wars and i thought of that mandalorian episode where uh from season one when mando goes and hooks up with the other bounty hunters on that space station and they go off and uh, they raid the Imperial or the New Republic prison ship to break out uh, that Twi'lek. Remember that one? Yes, yes. And um, it had a Trekkie vibe, didn't it? Well, you know, I looked at that space station and it was small, but it was similar to the mushroom shape of these things. But it was much smaller, and um, it looked more run down. It didn't have that Star Trek vibe I'm getting off of this mm. space station. Well, sure. yeah, there's definitely, I mean, th- what they're keeping with here is the used universe, whereas Trek always looks very shiny and new. Yes. And so this definitely looks more run down. Um, you know, this is the space station from the other side of the tracks. This is the, this the, the, this is the new fancy... Uh, bright white space station but um nonetheless thought it was interesting you know these obviously these designers they don't do this stuff on whims and it has to go through a whole process when they're making these concepts and somebody had to go okay cool that all right we'll take it it's a little tricky but we'll yeah. do it this type, you know science fiction based in space often feeds off of other movies other shows other franchises we've seen it forever where you know all of a sudden in star wars they're making the jump to light speed you start seeing the equivalent of that in other science fiction oh, yeah. shows too. you're right you know i mean the the line between jumping to warp speed in star trek and making the jump to hyperspace in star wars is very thin yeah so you know it's just the, the same thing in the different rapper essentially yeah, and then in Battlestar Galactica, they call it, you know, jump. So, you know, when they're when they're jumping, I don't, I can't mm-hmm. remember if they actually say hyperspace or what their term is, but they're always making these jumps. And they always have enough fuel to make, you know, X number of jumps. Right. I mean, even in, you know, classic arcade video games, you can jump to hyperspace. Like in right. the original Asteroids game, there's the hyperspace button. I think in Defender. You can jump to hyperspace. There's it's a good point that these things eventually sort of all sort of uh mush together and become part of what Kyle Newman? The zeitgeist the of zeitgeist. science fiction. <laughs> well, I mean like laser guns, you know. Yeah, they right. Appear in right. Everything. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure people are be- saying, Well, you know, Star Trek or Star Wars didn't invent all this stuff. I know it didn't. I know it didn't, but sometimes you see something and you go, ah, I've seen that before. And mm-hmm. there's a definite influence. So uh, anyway, you know, um, right at the top of the episode, Jim, um, when Fee is given the information to the Bad Batch about class one or a certain class of bounty hunters, we find out that they're class one bounty hunters mm-hmm. that have been retrieving m count targets for the empire so that's what that's really the crux of this this episode is that the batch is trying to figure out what the heck m count means that, that, that because they know that that's what makes omega interesting to hemlock so they don't know what it means and uh i mean there's a part of me that's a little bit like 
Like, really? You got to go find a bounty hunter, and then that bounty hunter is going to take you to something else just to find out something you should be able to look up in an encyclopedia? Or, you know, uh, can they Google this? Uh, is it? <laughs> I mean, even if it's uh, uh, slang, there's got to be some sort of, like, urban Jedi dictionary that they can find the definition of M count somehow. But nonetheless, but what did give me pause here is... What Fee says, and then Fennec says later, that this is uh, these are targets that are only going out to class one bounty hunters. And so what does that tell us? That, they, they, that it's only just the best of the best? Are these bounty hunters that can keep a secret? What is it about these class one bounty hunters that, mm -hmm. that make them the, uh, the only ones for the Empire in terms of going after these, these targets? Yeah, probably success rate. We mm -hmm. know there's a bounty hunter guild, and they probably right. keep track of things like that. And then you elevate through the ranks to become eventually a class one bounty hunter. And those guys usually get the top bounties that are out there, the most challenging bounties, the ones with the biggest payouts. That's for a class one bounty hunter. I, I, I think, you know, we could... Well, and these are force sensitives. If they have a high M count, there's a good likelihood that they are so this is maybe another way of describing this just occurred to me is this another way of describing the purge if they're hiring bounty hunters class one bounty hunters to go out and retrieve m count targets well, former jedi would certainly be m count high m count targets yeah, so it's yeah. not necessarily all about Project Necromancer. I'm sure there's some overlap here, but is that their sort of code for Jedi or for sensitives? Hmm. Well, you, you, you throw an in interesting wrinkle into the whole conversation. Um, you know, I was really just assuming these M count candidates for the Empire to experiment on are just. Um, like, yeah, how would you even know? How would you know? I mean, how, how right. do you how do you track down M count targets when the whole idea of M count is something that's kept totally on the down low? Right. I don't I don't think the Jedi went around telling everyone about well, no, I, I should take that back. Qui Gon Jinn was pretty loose lipped when speaking about <laughs> He's telling everybody. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, he was... yeah. Minichlorians, you know. Oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> so, uh, Shmi, I got half an hour to kill. I got to tell you all about these uh, Minichlorians, you know. But uh, oh, <laughs> we're doing this now. <laughs> oh, I just thought you know, just add a little authenticity to it here. Oh yeah, sure, you know. Yeah, let's go out and uh, look for M count, shall we? <laughs> I, I could go for some M&Ms, actually, you know. I like the pretzel ones. You ever throw those, a bag of the pretzel M&Ms in the freezer? Oh, it's delicious. You Very never know what direction <laughs> Liam's, Liam's going to take with this. Um, but, yeah, so they're out there looking for the – so the question, I guess, is how does this, how does this play out? So you've got, uh, you got the Empire. They are identifying through intelligence – and we're assuming with Inquisitors, they're identifying these targets, these high M count targets. These could be these could be beings that might in other times have been selected to become Jedi and train, or they could be former Jedi. There's a whole um, there's a there's a lot of reasons you know why they would come across the the, the Empire's attention, but. So they go to these bounty hunters, and do they do they say that this is the reason why they're going after these people? So what? Did, how do these bounty hunters connect the dots that the common denominator of all of these high targets are is this M count thing? Someone someone's talking. That, that has to be it. Someone's talking. Yeah, that's um, yeah. Wow, what a what a twist. You know, I was just like I said, really looking at this on surface level and thinking about. M count candidates for the empire to experiment on. I, I was just thinking about that in terms of what we've been hearing thus far in the show, mm -hmm. you know? Right. I yeah. wasn't, I wasn't looking at it beyond, beyond that. I, I thought that they were only 
testing on clones, though. I didn't know that they were just out there looking for candidates. I mean, that sounds... It's, and they call them targets. Is that how yeah. they're referred M to? M-count, yeah. They've been retrieving M-count targets for the Empire, this certain class of, of bounty hunter. And then, uh, yeah, and then at the end, when she's talking to the mystery voice, she says, yeah, they were asking about the Empire's M-count bounties. So, Jim, there's a lot of reasons why the Empire... Well, let's say there's there's two reasons we know of uh, why the Empire is interested in tracking down high midichlorian count targets. One is the extinction of the Jedi. They want to wipe them out. And the other is Palpatine needs these high M count targets to do all these experiments on on Mount Tantus. So these are the people that are in amber or whatever, whatever it is. Um, they're in stasis. Um and and we also know that some of these have turned into inquisitors. So there's another reason. Maybe th these are potential inquisitor candidates. But nonetheless, um, the fact that they're using bounty hunters, I just find fascinating. I assumed all this was happened, you know, was done by inquisitors. But you know, look look at who Vader. Tra I mean, Luke Skywalker is one of the highest targets you can think of, um, and Vader is commissioning. At that time, Invaders commissioning uh, all of those bounty hunters in Empire Strikes Back to try to find Han Solo, and it's all an elaborate scheme to get uh, Luke Skywalker. So, you know, the, look, we we used uh, we used gangsters. Uh, the United States government cooperated with gangsters in World War II. So it's not the first, you know, it's not the first time you lie down with dogs. Um, and well, so the Empire and then to do this. Then there's the CIA, and we're not even going to get into all of that. <laughs> right, right. Um, yikes. So um, sometimes you have to turn uh, to to their uh, that kind of scum, as they call them in Empire. Maybe they need just the blood from these M-count targets because they keep testing clone after clone after clone to see if they have the capability to withstand injections of midichlorian rich blood mm -hmm. so they sort of need a, a huge supply considering the amount of test subjects they have with all of these clone troopers mm -hmm. enough to fill a mountain so <laughs> yeah, you, you, right. you, you need a lot of blood it, it can't all just come from darth vader or palpatine um they have to go out and find these targets Oh, yeah, sure, you know. You know, I think uh, what M count uh, stands for, you know, Swank, is uh, Marlboro. Yeah. Do you have a spare, Swank? You have no, a spare? I'm afraid I don't. I got some cigars mm. over here, but I got no no Marlboros. Oh, yeah. no. no Marlboros, bro. Um, all right. Well, you can uh, give us a call uh, later on here. I do want to put up the uh, the number. This is a call-in show. We want to, we're monitoring the chat. We see some super chats have already come in. Thank you for those. We'll get to them. And uh, so if you have your own theories about uh, these M count targets and class one bounty hunters, uh, please give us a call 708-866-1737. That's 708-866-1737. Our call screener and the official program observer here at RFR is standing by Tyler Page. Uh, so this was a little, uh, I thought, maybe this might be a little Easter egg in the bar or in the cantina there on that space station. I saw this dude. I don't know if you caught him, but uh, he looks like he's wearing a uh, Han Solo white shirt, black vest, and tan pants. I feel like he is sporting the uh, the Solo look there. Mm -hmm. Well, he's definitely a scoundrel. Oh, yeah. Um, he might be a nerf herder. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I did. Uh, the one thing I did like about this cantina was the... The pit droid bartender wearing the floppy hat and goggles. I thought that was kind of nice. I, I love when uh, pit droids accessorize. Oh, yeah, I think I, I, it's a, not a great shot, but yeah, yeah, he's got the <laughs> floppy hat. Guy, yeah. <laughs> it's like you know he's about ready to go fishing or something. But um, yeah, fun little cantina, um, and that that pit droid doesn't mess around either. You know, no, you, you start 
you start a problem in his bar, he's going to smash a bottle upside your head. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed this sequence. I thought it was great. I thought that um, Fennec's entrance was very cool. I mean, she didn't enter, but her her reveal, I mm -hmm. thought, was very cool as she was uh, sitting there very confidently at the uh, at the table, kind of had a, you know, with her arm over the back of the seat, very relaxed, very sure of herself, very confident, comfortable, having that conversation with that, with that Rodian. Um, so this was definitely giving me Han Solo vibes as well, sitting there at the table in the cantina with the Rodian. I half expected her to shoot first and settle this once and for all, that uh, you always shoot the Rodian first. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if they all sizzle the way Greedo did after Han shot him. Have you ever noticed that? They put that in the, the sound design, a little sizzle after Greedo hits his head, hits the table. I always thought yeah. that was a nice touch. I wonder if Ben Burke was always... making some eggs that morning, and he's like, hmm, <laughs> let's throw yeah. this in there. Uh, the, he, he did hit the kitchen for a lot of sound effects. A lot well, of I always them. felt that. Um, and I have to go back and, and revisit this, but my memory of, as you're talking about the sizzle, my memory of the first time I saw A New Hope, I recall the blasters ha having flames. Like when they would hit the stormtroopers, it, there, was a, there was a flame. And so they were, yes. there was like a sizzle. And then over time, I feel like George has really tamped that down to where you don't oh, even yeah. really see much of an impact on the, on the armor. As much as you use. There's to. a famous shot in the original cut of Star Wars when they're um, they're raiding the, um, the the prison on board the Death Star to to rescue the princess, and you know uh, it was right right after this big gun battle. Han, you know, says, "Oh, we're all fine here. Everything's fine. How are you?" You know, in that sequence, Han or Chewie shoots an Imperial officer. And the little uh, squib effect on the guy's shirt actually lit his shirt on fire. And you see the flames yeah. burning the stunt guy as he <laughs> spins around and goes down. And George, he cleaned that up in the special edition to make it look a, a little less grisly. You know, I kind of like but the grisly. That's probably what you're thinking of, really, is that's uh, that was from the original edit. Seven-year-old uh, me yeah, liked the grizzly. I thought it was cool. <laughs> really oh, did. yeah. I really did. Yeah, I was just having a conversation earlier this week about the importance of that original cut of Star Wars, the 77 release, and how important it is to get that out there and make that available to people to view. You know, it's, it's not to, to, you know, see, you can have all the special editions you want, but just for historical perspective, to be able to understand what really made an impact on the industry, it was that original film. Yeah. And making that unavailable to fans and, and, and for the sake of cinema history, it really should be preserved and released as a, a, an official release. You know, I mean, we could find versions online that fans create and everything, but it, it, it really deserves that. It, it really, you, you can't just keep going back to the well and say, well, no, this is the, this is, you can see, you can, I mean, you can, you can say, this is the, the quintessential definitive. version of Star yeah. Wars, the definitive edition. Yes. But that doesn't mean you make the original one extinct because you're destroying film history by doing that. Yeah, I absolutely it's a, I agree. Just, yeah. It's it's more than just you finessing the story and the effects. It, it, there's 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 more to that when it's a when it's a film of this historical importance, magnitude, impact, all of that. I definitely agree. Um yeah. So the uh the character, the the bounty, so the bad batch have to uh in order to get the information from Fennec Shand, it's going to cost them something. And what it's going to cost them is their time and their talents. She needs a tracker and she needs some muscle with Wrecker. So uh, she tells them about this bounty that she has, this uh, Silar Saris guy, uh, the, the 
the praying mantis species, the yamril. And uh, I went back and I was surprised. I don't think that they've, have they named praying mantis? I know at the time they were shooting A New Hope, the praying mantis character in the cantina uh, was just known as the praying mantis. But I can't, does he have a name? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like Keed Katak or something. Oh, like that. oh, that's right. Kit Kat or Kit Kit Kit. Kit yeah, I know. Keed, yep. Yeah, whatever his name yeah. is. We'll, we'll get it in the chat, I'm sure. Um, but uh, Jack Purvis was the puppeteer on that uh, praying mantis puppet in uh, A New Hope. Of course, he was also ah. the, the lead Jawa, and his son, Andy Purvis, was the uh, power droid. And a new hope. So it was a family affair. Jack did a number of roles, and so did Andy throughout the original trilogy. But I did not know that Jack was operating the the praying mantis there in the cantina. That was cool. So it's neat yeah. to see this the the design of this character come back. Um, and um, so the deal that they make is that she might know Fennec might know somebody who knows more about these M count targets. Um. She doesn't know. She says, I haven't, want, I haven't done one of those jobs, but I know someone who has. And as long as they help her bring this bounty in, she's willing to play ball and, and help them out. So that's it. The plot is set in motion at that point. And um, I think, I don't want to spoil the ending for anybody here, but um, I think that the... Uh, bounty hunter that she's going to lead them to is cad bane that's that would be my guess ah, that's that's a, a really good guess yeah um it, it, she communicates with this other bounty hunter who has the down low on m count yeah and um it's obviously someone that we know from the vast history of star wars it's someone we would be able to recognize um and the reason I'm so confident about that is because they didn't let us see or hear who this person was. Right. So they're trying to create a little bit of mystery, which will eventually lead to the reveal of who this character is probably next week. Now, it could be Cad Bane because he's definitely in the mix. Mm -hmm. He appeared in season one of The Bad Batch. We know he's still out there and active. He's in the um, trailer. Oh, he is in the trailer. He is in the trailer, yeah. So we can expect to see Cat Bane this season. Yeah. That I didn't know. I was thinking of um, him. He was uh, one of my main candidates. Another candidate for who the bounty hunter is, uh, who we cannot see or understand, but uh, we know who it is. It, it could be Asajj Ventress. Yeah. Who I'm surprised we haven't seen yet this season, considering she was also promoted in the trailer. Um, another candidate could be Boba Fett. If anybody knows something about M counts, it's him. And, mm. and he was mentioned in season one of the, uh, you know, in one of those there early was a sound effect. And I was going to ask you about that. Ooh, I didn't when catch she's it. having the conversation, I thought I heard that little radio frequency that you get mm. when Boba Fett. But then I talked myself out of it being Boba because then doesn't that make it odd that they kind of meet? It seems like they meet for the first time in Book of Boba Fett. Um, hmm. I don't I feel don't like they have any that. past relationship when you uh, when he saves her. Yeah, I don't know about that. Another candidate, it could be Tech. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. It He's a bounty be. hunter. No, no. Well, while we're talking about this final scene, I want to get your thoughts and we can get uh, thoughts of our folks in the chat and giving us a call, is the dialogue here at the very end when she's communicating with someone and she says, I just finished a job with some clones. They were asking about the M Empire's M count bounties. What can you tell me? I'm sure you can track them down easily enough. I'll send you what I have. Are we talking about a betrayal here or 
Mm. Is Fennec Shan's contact so afraid to say this information over comms that, you know, he or she is like, no, this is too hot. I can't say this. Uh, I'm going to have to tell, talk to them face to face if they want this information. Could be. I was just surprised that Fennec didn't have the information that she was using to bargain with the uh, Bad Batch. She said, you know, she made it seem like the information on M count was something she could deliver to them right away. Yeah. And she didn't, she had no idea. And she had to reach out to another bounty hunter to, you know, say, hey, what do you know? Mm -hmm. This other bounty hunter must owe her something for it to be that easy for yeah, her. Yeah, she to... didn't know any more than Fee. I mean, right. Fee said, to, told him the same damn thing. She said that. Yeah, there was a class of bounty hunters that uh, were familiar with these targets. They tracked down Fennec. Now, it wasn't like Fee said, oh, go find Fennec Shan because she knows more than I do. They're the ones that said, well, we've met some bounty hunters. Let's let's start with her. It was Omega's idea. Excuse me. But, um, yeah, they really didn't. All they did was sort of kind of maybe make a new friend. I don't know. It depends on how you assess this last scene here is this betrayal or is this um again them needing to deliver this information face to face because it's mm -hmm. too scary or you know they're too concerned empires monitoring communications things like that so i don't know i think we're meant to be uh yeah i think we're meant to be trying to figure it out they didn't yeah, draw any direct conclusions so yeah, we're meant to speculate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, you know, she she did play the Bad Batch a little bit. But at least we know she's looking to to uh, settle with them, you know, and, 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 and stay true to her end of the deal. At least we know she's, she didn't just ditch them because she could have easily done that. But she is showing a little bit of integrity by actually acquiring the information she probably should have had in the first place. Yeah. But, um, that was the only time in the episode where I was like, Oh, really? <laughs> 25 minutes later. And we, we don't know any more than we did before when it comes to, or the bad batch doesn't know. We know as the audience, mm -hmm. we know there's really no, uh, gosh, I mean, there's, we already know what the M count is. So there's not a whole lot of suspense for us. Right. But what we're waiting for is, well, what is Omega's reaction going to be? And what are the Bad Batchers' reaction going to be when they realize that this has some sort of Force-sensitive connection, Jedi connection? You know, these guys are all uh, veterans of having worked under Jedi. Um, speaking of Jedi, this was a nice little scene here at the end when Omega was teaching crosshair some yoga no he was it wasn't yoga he was he was <laughs> no, teaching him how to teaching him how to meditate and hopefully by through meditation he will perhaps heal what it is psychologically that is um hampering his ability to be the expert marksman that he was and the, the, the hand and all of that but i have to say when i saw this shot jim it reminded me of something else did it, <laughs> the death of Luke Skywalker. Oh right? yeah, reminded me of. That. <laughs> I mean, it was all there. It was all there. We just needed twin sons. It was very tranquil, you know. But uh, I don't know. It it's a it's it's close. It's close with the sunset. Now it's not two suns, but with the water and sitting on the rock. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're even uh, positioning the characters almost in the same place Luke yeah. was positioned in the composition of that frame. <laughs> and it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I found it funny um, that Omega said she learned how to uh, meditate from Gunji and the Wookiees on Kashyyyk. Right. So I went back uh, to that episode, season two, episode five tribe. And I'm like, when, when did this happen? When did she learn how to, how to meditate from the Wookiees. I don't remember them doing that. And there's this one brief shot toward the end of the episode where Gunji and Omega 
are, they have their hands up on a tree and their heads are down and they are like communicating with the tree. So I don't know if that's mm. the form of oh, meditation yeah. they're talking I remember about that now. Yes. Mm-hmm. But I got to tell you, I half expected and maybe I'm just naive. I don't know, but I half expected for something to happen in this, during this meditation, I thought that Omega was going to make a little rock, just kind of like wobble or wiggle or something. (laughs) (laughs) And it was going to, and I'm not, I don't really have a dog in this race uh, when it comes to Omega being force sensitive or learning to wield the force. Hell, we know now as Star Wars fans that everyone has the potential to wield the force. Everyone has a connection to the force through the midichlorians. Some are higher than others. I do think that some people are reading into Omega a little bit too much because all that we know, all that we know is that her blood reacts with high midichlorian count blood in a way that is sustainable for the body to survive. And 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 we don't necessarily know if by mixing a little bit of that midichlorian blood in her system, that now all of a sudden, you know, she's got off the charts, you know, high T or high M. <laughs> um, we well, don't know that. That's a bit of a leap. And again, there there's some really, really passionate fans out there like us, but passionate fans that are like, oh, you guys are missing it. She's force sensitive. It's so obvious. So this mm. was the moment I thought that she would discover this sort of latent force ability because it felt very much like a Jedi meditation that she was kind of taking Crosshair through. But I thought, wouldn't that be interesting if she didn't even realize what she was doing and all of a sudden a rock starts to float up? Hmm. Oops. Yeah, she she and Boba are the only two clones that have original unaltered DNA taken from Jango Fett. Just them. That That's something that makes them unique. And I just wonder if Omega's blood is able to withstand the M count infusion. And and keep in mind, they never in, like reintroduced that blood back into Omega's system. It was in a test tube. And good um, point. She, That's right. She was long gone. You know, yes. she was long gone from Tantis by yep. the time they realized that it worked. But uh, I, I wonder if Boba Fett also is a candidate for this type of M count experimentation because they, they're, they come from Jango Fett unaltered original DNA. And that's part of what made Omega so important to Nala say and Lama Sue and, and the operation on Camino is because the clone DNA that they were using from Jango Fett was beginning to deteriorate. And that made the Kaminoans nervous about the empire. So they wanted to create a more superior clone. And to do so, they would have had to use the DNA from Omega. Mm. But then mm-hmm. that goes back to that question. Can you clone a clone? Right. I think you can. I think you can. Maybe we should assume so until we find out you can't. Yes. <laughs> so, so. It's RFR canon that cloning of clones is not just a possibility. Um, It's a good strategy. So we're going to go with that. Yeah. Uh, All right. We got some super chats here. Let's uh, take a look and see what we got from here's uh, Meteorav. Meteorav says, superb episode, better than the Acolyte trailer. Well, we're going to get to that this week on Rebel Force Radio, the uh, weekly podcast. So make sure that you're... They are on Saturday morning when that episode drops. We'll be covering the Acolyte trailer. Uh, Trey Thornhill says, uh, first time in the chat. Oh, it's nice to have you. And thanks for the uh, the two bucks. Appreciate it. Salvi Krom is here. He's here just about each and every week. He says, uh, oh, Salvi Crystal not in this episode. Oh, he's making sure that it does not rear its head. We are not going to have appearance by Cerveza Crystal. Not happening. <laughs> Not this week. Good try, though. Uh, Media Rav says uh, it's cheaper to animate against a black background. So that's obviously in response to some of our conversation about how dark the show looks. 
Um, well, I, I will. I will take your. Uh, I will take your word for that. I don't know anything about uh, the cost of animating on dark backgrounds versus light backgrounds. Uh, and I feel like they're 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 animating this in the way that they always do it, but they're making it darker after the fact. So yes, I think they still right. create the same worlds and all of that. So because it gets lit differently depending on where they're at, what kind of actual lights are in the the frame itself. So at some points, the background has to be lit up a little bit. So I, I think they're just making the whole thing dark. They're not starting with darkness and then building on that. They're creating the show as they always do. Jason just put up a screen grab from, <laughs> I guess it's this episode. I can't make out anything in the screen grab. I see a couple of kind of blobs. Yeah, and I this gotta is, like, press my face up against the screen to even make out anything. This is Silar Saris. This is the bounty, and the the whole sequence when they capture him, and he's evading them, and they're they're fighting. It, I just, I I just kind of assume my way through that episode or that that part of the episode. That okay, I think they're fighting. Oh, that looks like Wrecker. All uh, oh, that's Hunter. All oh, here comes Fennec. Oh, does she have her her blaster rifle? You know, that's really what it was. I just kind of had to assume what was happening, and I don't think I should have to go out. I, for those that are talking about, I have a pretty nice TV, <laughs> so um, I don't feel like I should I should need to go out and and you know buy a TV that costs twice as much or or have some professional come in and and uh, fine tune it just so I can watch a Star Wars cartoon. Come on, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's dark. It's dark. Uh, N64 Rescue says, I appreciate my brothers, Jason and Jimmy, so much. You put the star in Star Wars for me. Wow, man. That is very nice. nice of you to say. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And here's a guy that uh, is, always seems to be in the chat, uh, John David. He says, finally, a filler episode and a good one. Ming-Na never fails. Also, this is the first episode this season that goes back and forth between separate character scenes yes yes um i did notice that i didn't know it was the first episode of the season but i did like how they were bouncing back and forth from the mission that hunter and wrecker were on with uh finnick and mm -hmm. then they go back to abu and because the contrast was so strong and um and i i, I did like the pacing of it all I did. Sometimes I, did I get annoyed when it cuts back and forth too much, you know, when they're trying to shove too much into one thing. But this one had really good pacing, I felt. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's very much a a George hallmark, right? I mean, George was always having sort of things happening on, on multiple fronts. You know, when you when you look at the way the original films were structured and you get the action, the, the space battle, you get something happening on the planet it's the Death Star duel happening over there. So cutting back and forth between these things, um, that seems to be a, a very George, very George thing. Uh, something else I really liked as we're, we're talking about this is I love this, like, bayou, this Everglades. I don't think we've ever seen this kind of environment in visual Star Wars. Uh, it was pretty yes, cool. Yeah, I liked yeah. it. It was like this little, oh, we have? Yes. Um, I think back to the Clone Wars episode, The Hunt for Zero. <laughs> and Why uh, would you remember that episode, Jim? Why? Why? Well, for obvious <laughs> reasons, of course. As president of the Zero the Hut fan club. <laughs> um, no, I just, I, they, they, had, they were out on a swamp. It was Qui-Gon. <gasps> no, it was. Yes. It was, yes. It was Quinlan Voss and Obi-Wan Kenobi. And they were looking for for Mama the Hut and uh, <laughs> Mama. <laughs> and, yep, you know, I'm remembering they're, they're on some sort of, uh, what do you call those with the big propellers in the back, uh, the swamp skier or whatever blades. it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. You're so, right, you're right. So I, I did recall it. that episode while watching this one. <laughs> Good yeah. memory. Good memory. <laughs> I liked it. I liked the little boathouse and then... Uh, the ship that they were on, the boat that they were on. And I felt like it 
it hovered over the water until they came to a stop and then it like it went down into the water kind of like a the way the land speeder works um in in some ways but some really talk about light uh i thought that this the whole way that this planet looked sort of the yellows and oranges thought was really cool gave me some cloud city vibes a little bit with for the, sure the, the color palette for sure and, and yeah. the, the the stock with uh, the tanks on it mm -hmm. is, is that holding something up or is that just a tower i think it's, it's isn't it holding some like big refinery up or something oh well, maybe i don't know but maybe. um those tanks look similar to some ralph mccrory artwork early artwork of cloud city mm. and uh yeah I, I i got the cloud city vibes from this too I got the Star Trek vibes from that space station. I get the Cloud City vibes from the Swamp Planet. A lot of vibes, a lot of good vibes. Here is uh, Jeremy Lanning, uh, Super Chat. Thanks, Jeremy. That's awesome. He says, I see a lot of darkness on the edge of town. I see a lot of darkness on the edge of town. I don't know if that's a re – is that a song lyric? What is What is he referencing here? Yeah, well, like it's, it's an here. album from Bruce Springsteen. So, oh, all right. Um. I don't know. I, I don't know my I don't boss. Know what, I don't know my boss. In what Springsteen. context? We're just talking about mean? darkness. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, <laughs> all right. And then there's always somebody in the chat who who's above it all, and they say things like, uh, "I I don't have the chat in front of me, but it it was the comment was, my TV's old as hell, and I can see everything just fine. I don't know what the big problem is." <laughs> huff, huff. <laughs> well, I mean, listen, we're just. You can't deny the fact that the visuals are extremely muted and it's very dark, especially for an animated show. I mean, you can't deny that. Yeah. So we're just talking about it. It's right. not like, you know. <laughs> These guys. <laughs> Go watch the show on your old TV. I don't care. <laughs> uh, the I, I got to reference this because, you know, with the... With the New Zealand accent, it's pretty close to the uh, Australian accent, and I couldn't help but think as Wrecker and, and Hunter are wrestling these crocodiles, I just wanted Wrecker to say, what a little beauty, as he was staring in the face <laughs> of, one of one of these. Oh, we made him mad now. Uh, so that was, <laughs> that was cool. But, yeah, that was, you know, pretty intimidating. But they're also – you know, a hallmark of the Bad Batch with the monsters. There's always a monster. I, I kind of wondered if Wrecker was going to say, why is there always a monster? <laughs> hey, you know what I noticed is that in previous seasons, they made a big deal about how Hunter was really good with a blade. And he almost sort of like worshipped his knife and stuff, like kind of in a Rambo sort of way. And uh, we, we don't really get to see him swinging the blade around too often anymore. Even in an episode like this where you hmm. have, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're involved in hand-to-hand -hand combat with this uh, Siler character, and he's slinging the blade. You know, I thought we, maybe yeah. we'd see a little Hunter and Siler uh, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the knives, a la West Side Story, you know? <laughs> Turn it into a musical. <laughs> That'd be great. But... You, you don't, you don't, they don't really play up that edge with Hunter like they did in earlier seasons or earlier episodes. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, you, you would have, I, you would have thought you would have had those knives, you know, clanking together there. It would have been a perfect opportunity, but it does seem to be something they kind of dropped. There was also, you didn't really see him with all that vegetation, you know, kind of chopping his way through it. I thought that right. would be another natural Hunter moment. But uh, no, it didn't. Eh. It didn't happen. Maybe knives out is too much of a Ryan Johnson thing. We don't want to <laughs> Star Wars go back into that territory anymore. No, definitely not. Well, hey, guess who? It finally made it. I think he's feeling better, folks. You know who I'm talking about. It's time for our buddy Blake and Blake's take. Blake, is it really hey, you? Chut, chut. Hey, chut chut, buddy. Glad you're feeling yeah. better. People were very concerned yeah, yeah, last just week. Just out of the back of the tank. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just out of the back of the tank. Well, that's what we thought. No, there were a lot of uh, people very concerned about you. Um, 
They know that you uh, never miss a show, but we're glad you're here and glad you're feeling better. And I'm guessing that you got some things to lay on us. We've thrown a lot of ideas out. Um, so what's your take, Blake? Um, so I have something from last episode that I want to talk about. But first, at the beginning of the show, you guys were talking about the uh, the spaceship thing where they went to go meet uh, Finnick Shan, how it looks like a thing from Star Trek. That's right. Yeah. Uh, whenever I was watching the episode, it immediately came to my mind the place in uh, Freemakers. Lego oh, Freemakers. Okay. That's where nine, like, the whole show is. That's, it looks exactly like that. Oh, basically. the whole show's what based I was there. Thinking. Okay. All right. So the whole show is based on a space station that looks an awful lot like this with sort of the two discs and then sort of connected with in the center there. That's a good yeah, observation. So that, that's where the uh, Freemakers do all their, that's where they have their business and right. go into all the other rooms. See, this and is why we have the young people call us is, because they're later. watching the Freemaker adventures and that's they, right. can, they can bring this to us. Blake watches it. So you don't have to. <laughs> it's not that bad. Blake, I have a feeling that you cut your teeth on Freemaker Adventures as a Star Wars fan. I would I would actually like to listen to the Freemaker Adventures after show hosted by Blake. That's the only way that I wanna that I wanna uh consume Freemaker Adventures, but good eye. Um, yeah, and so from last episode, you guys were talking about uh, the whole Clone clone X, mm -hmm. what they're called, right? Yeah. Yeah, you guys were, uh, there were a bunch of theories that it could be Tech or some other people. Jimmy Mack said maybe Cody, Commander Cody, mm -hmm. but I didn't get to listen to the show while, since I was in bed sleeping during it. So we were in the car, and I was listening to it, and while you guys were listening off things, I said, man, what about Commander Cody? And as soon as I said that, Jimmy said, what about uh, well, Commander Cody at the exact same time I said Whoa. it, and I was like, stop. Great and minds think the alike. Time. There you go. There you go. Great minds. Great minds, Blake. Yes. yes. Were you reaching? Were you yeah, having? Was, wait, wait. Were you force timing, Blake? Jimmy Mac, were you? Is that what was going on? Yeah, you know, sometimes that's how we communicate when the show's not on the air. We do a little force timing. I show up at his baseball games sometimes, you know. <laughs> I, I'll even get, I'll get, you know, my jersey a little dirty if I have to. And then when I, and then I'll be like, oh my God, where'd all this dirt come from? How did, how is this possible? Right, once you go back to your reality, there you are with the dirt on the, on the yeah, jersey. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of fun. So, Blake, your money is on one of, well, or this latest Clone X, the one that we have, at, that we're left with at the end of Episode 7. Your money is on, on Cody, huh? It could be Cody, but also everyone was talking about tech, but I don't think it's tech because we don't know, like, it, do we know about if he's, like, good with a sniper? Like, has, I, don't, I don't think I've ever seen him use a sniper. Like a sniper cool. rifle or have a, a moment where he's he's exhibiting those skills. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because I don't think he's ever in any of the episodes. That, I, like, you know, I didn't I didn't sniper. Yeah, there was a lot of there was a lot of talk about how where you had Crosshair squaring off with the, the clone X trooper and they were both, you know, in their sniper positions. I didn't take that as, oh, this particular clone X has a real, you know, has a really keen, uh, you know, keen eye. So he's a great, he's a great um, assassin uh, sniper. I didn't look at it like that was unique to that particular clone X. I just assumed that they all have this incredible training, like a Navy SEAL or any kind of like really advanced, um, uh, advanced trained operative. I. So I didn't I didn't read much mm -hmm. into that at all, actually. I didn't go, oh, well, clearly this must be someone who learned from Crosshair or this this particular clone had some sort of infusion of Crosshair's abilities. He's a clone of Crosshair. Um, 
So yeah, I didn't really read that too much into that. So it could be tech, I guess. Um, we had somebody call in and say that well, if if you if you notice when he's looking at when tech is looking at the clone X through the macro binoculars and he's seeing the heat seeking or that you know he's doing the the body temperature view, uh, there's no body temperature registering on the legs, and so that means that it's got to be tech because we know tech crushed his legs before he fell to his death. That, yeah. Uh, it, that's a stretch. I mean, there's a lot of people who say it's tech, but, like, I'm more leading the word to just some random clone, or it could be Cody. Just, he went through, like, a bunch, a bunch of training. Because he's one person we haven't seen uh, this season. Yeah. Well, we seen, right. we haven't seen a lot of people, but, like, yeah, we I'm haven't going seen from clones that we haven't really seen. Right. Well, what about this episode? What do you think is... What do you think Crosshair's prognosis is? Do you think we're going to see him go on this 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 journey of meditation and inward discovery and sort of heal himself? I think slowly over time he's slowly going to. We only got seven episodes, Blake. I think it's going to be. It's definitely going to be before. Like it's going to be. Probably a couple episodes before the season finale, because they're gonna have a like a big thing happen at the end of the season. So Crosshair is gonna have his snipe ready, and he's just gonna like n- not miss a shot like how he normally does. Mm. He's gonna finally have a steady hand that's not shaking all the time, and he'll actually be able to shoot. Right, there'll stuff. be a big moment where he he's there's a shot that he's got to make. And he's he's gonna make it. He's gonna make it. Yeah, that'll be the yeah. yeah, yeah. He'll have his powers. He'll have his powers back. And um, um, uh, and what about this mystery bounty hunter at the end, Blake? You're good at giving these um these guesses. You're already guessing about Cody and Clone X, echoing Jimmy Mac. Jimmy Mac, and I identified several candidates. It could be Cad Bane. It could be Asajj Ventress. It could be Boba Fett. Someone on the chat said it could be Darth Vader. It could be Hemlock. <laughs> Unlikely. Um, like it could for it could be Asajj. I one of the main people, one of the the three main people I was thinking was Asajj, Boba, and Cad Bane. But then I thought more and more. But it could just be that they were trying to cover up who it is. But with the voice, you can't really understand them. It's a bit harder to understand what they were saying. I think the idea is that it's encrypted. I feel like that what we're supposed to take away from that, that's my read is that it's some sort of encryption going on. It could be. Because otherwise, who speaks like that? It could be, it could be Zuckus or like Forlom or like Bosch, someone like that. I mean, Bosch. Not Bosch. Well, we're sitting here waiting for two big characters to emerge because we saw them in the trailer. Asajj Ventress and Cad Bane. Yeah, I feel like Asajj and Cad Bane might be in the same episode. Yeah? Because they might hit you with like a double-double big thing in in the one episode that both of them are in. Like, it'll just hit like that. You You think they're working together? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. It could be that that's maybe she could have called. She could have been talking the Cad thing, mm-hmm. and then Cad Bane gets Asajj in on this, and oh, that's why like, hey, the trailer. Hey, Asajj, uh, come over here. Guess Fennec's on the line. <laughs> uh, you got to hear this. All right. Uh, Blake, it's always good to talk to you, buddy. We've got a, a pretty full switchboard, so we want to get to some other callers. But great that you're feeling better. Great that you're um, giving us a call. Always always great to talk to you. All right. See you. All right, buddy. <laughs> Bye, Blake. Good one. Uh, all right. We've got a Patreon. Uh, Marty. Marty from Georgia. Marty wants to get on the uh, conversation here. About who Fennec was talking to. Hey, Marty. Hey, chat, chat, fellas. Chat, chat. Yeah, definitely. Chut, chut. Um, 
I, I, I don't have anything new or original to add. I, I thought at first it was Cad Bane, but then I remember that um, him and Fennec did not leave on the best terms in season one of Bad Batch. Mm -hmm. Right. So I was like, it's probably not him. And then I thought about Book of Boba Fett, how it seemed like the first time they met was after Boba rescued Fennec. My money's on Ventress, but man, I really want to see young Boba Fett in the armor, Clone Wars era. Just, <laughs> that would just, be great. Just that, that's, that's the hope. And um, other random thought I had, at first when I saw the uh, Rodian talking to Fennec, I thought how cool that would be if that was Greedo. Just a random Greedo cameo. You, but, well, I don't know. I, maybe that was a stretch in it, though. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I mean, but, he looked a lot like Greedo. Um, I, I treat but, every yeah. roadie I, like he's I, Greedo. I, I, <laughs> for the longest time, I just referred to <laughs> that species as a Greedo. Hey, look, there's a Greedo in the this scene. You know, when <laughs> when Greedo showed back up in Return of the Jedi. My my brother and my cousins and I, when we would play with the action figures, we would bring all of our collections together, and we, I think we had three Greedos between us, and um, I never got to be any of the core characters when we would play. I was the youngest, so they would make me be all the background characters, and I always got to be Greedo and Reese and <laughs> these characters, and uh, but I, in my own head canon, I always had Greedo. And he was the guy from A New Hope. And then I had Guido. And Guido was, <laughs> was the one in Return of the Jedi. But I guess it's like Greedo the Elder or something. What, no, what no, is no. In... Beedo. Beedo. His name is Beedo. <laughs> oh, he's is Beedo. the one Sorry. in Jabba's Palace. Okay. Beedo is in Jabba's I, Palace. I think that came from a top See, that's what I first about you guys. And we can just. What was what was well, that? you that's walk into a room and you take Greedo take... to me and Twink. Off we go. So, <laughs> you know, that's all no, they... I, that's uh, why I appreciate it. how we can just take... Uh, I was going to say, I appreciate how this uh, one little character. And we have yeah, these great conversations. I think that's what makes the Bad Batch such an enjoyable show is just these little background things in the universe of Star Wars. Like, even seeing the pit droids tonight, that made me really mm. happy. Yeah, just I like that pit droid. Goofball antics, so... The thing that, you yeah, know, so I think Dave, the show Dave and Filoni, yeah, Filoni's made a lot of great contributions to Star Wars. But one of the things that he's done really, really well is I love the way he has, through all of these series, fused together elements of the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy together to make it mm -hmm. one cohesive universe. I think before before the Clone Wars and before Rebels and... um. It was it was harder to look at them as the same universe because the style was so different and the aesthetic was so different between the two trilogies. But man, if if they didn't really pull that off, and I I love that about the way Star Wars animation has has has, has yeah, helped that. That's, that's very true. Now, Greedo the Elder was featured in an episode of the Clone Wars, if you remember. Oh, uh, was Greedo he the, the senator? El Is he a senator? Uh, no, he's not a senator. He's senator. just you know, kind of like a another cantina denizen, you know. Mm. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Well, is that the I, one I, that I, Filoni put in Kenner colors? Is that Greedo no, the Elder? No, I don't think so. Oh, man, there's too many Rodians now. I don't now. think so. Then there was a young Greedo <laughs> was featured in The Phantom Menace in a deleted yes. scene. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And, and you can get in a fight yeah. with, with him. And you can read yeah. it in the novelization. I remember I remember cheating, cheating, because I got the novel for Phantom Menace before I saw the film. And I said, okay, I'm only going to read this prologue. That's all I'm going to read. <laughs> and, I, and I loved it because it was young Anakin and he's displaying compassion and all this and you know and it's like oh that's cool there's a greedo cameo and i remember sitting there in the movie theater waiting for that scene at the beginning of the movie and it it never happened and i go of oh, course they don't always include all these scenes <laughs> but i, I don't always thought they shot with... it did they shoot that scene jim yes yes it's oh it it's is on the uh the dvd yeah. or i think oh. you can see the deleted scenes on disney plus oh okay. uh, if not i'm sure somebody put it on youtube must have seen um, them 
I always just thought it was so funny, even going all the way back to 77. Han shoots Greedo. Greedo's head hits the table. You, you hear the sizzle. You see a little bit of smoke coming out of him. Han walks over to bartender, goes, sorry about the mess, and walks out. And then the next scene, you see Luke and Ben walking on the streets of Moss Eisley. And Luke's saying, I'm never coming back here again. And you see Greedo walk right behind him. I was like, wait a second. What's going <laughs> and on? And he's in the hangar with Jabba. Yeah, well, that wasn't part of the original edit back in the day. That Jabba yeah, scene oh, yeah. does help us establish that Greedo certainly wasn't the only one of his species in Moss, Moss Eisley. And they all dress the right. same. It's like there's only one place to buy clothes on the planet Rhodey. And so, yeah. So, yeah, well, once I we became aware of that, then it was okay. Uh, and then, and then, like I said, the, the one in Jabba's Palace in Return of the Jedi, he is Beedo. Beedo. B-E-E-D-O. Mm-hmm. So you got Greedo and you got Beedo. Wow. Yes. So what's the name of the Rodian in this episode of Bad Badge? You see a Rodian coming towards towards you. you go, yeah, I'll, I'll bet his Pito. name ends in a vowel. Pito. P says pedo. Oh, P- <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, okay. That's that's even worse than my joke. All right, Marty, thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, who do we got here? Uh, David from Boston. He's going to leapfrog Andrew because he is a Patreon member, and we appreciate it. Thank you, David. Hey, chut, chut, guys. Oh, chut, chut. David, please tell me you are How not you driving. Doing? Please tell me you're not driving down the highway oh, with yeah, the top down. No, no, I'm near home. It's There's no electrical storm tonight. <laughs> Clear it with Tyler. All good. All right. Make it very quick points. Uh, I'm sorry, got Tickets for the Bristol event. I'm going to have a awesome. very special guest. He's going to have what now? Uh, I don't know. Apparently, the electrical no, storm is here. You, you're breaking up. Uh, oh, honest, is it David. bad again? It's bad. It's bad. You want to oh, call I'm us sorry. back when you get home? Are you allowed? Are you I allowed will. to talk I'll to call. us when you get home? I'm. <laughs> Wait, you guys are busting me. Are you? I'll be <laughs> home in five minutes. I'm sorry. All right. That's I'll all call. right. You, Wait, can you hear me or not? It's real choppy. It's real choppy. And as soon as you, when you're asking me I'll, if I I'll, can hear you, I'll be able to hear you. But when you start talking right. and making a point, I won't be able to. I tr- promise you. Let 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 Tyler know I'm calling him back in five minutes. All right. He he's I, the official program observer, so he will uh, he will know. He will know. Yeah. Uh, we we really discourage people from calling from their cars. Uh, other than the obvious choppiness of the quality of the call, there's, it always seems like the delay is super fat when someone is on the road. So when you call us, call from, uh, you know, a, a location you're in, you're settled in, and also no hands free or earbuds. Pro tip. Pick up the phone and hold it right to your mouth. That's for sound quality purposes. Yeah, yeah, because the sound for the phone calls, it has to travel. All through this this whole rigmarole that we got, and then out to you all. It's not as direct as what we have with our with our setup. So um, it's like cloning a cloning of a clone of a clone of a clone. That's what's that's what's happening. Let's talk to uh, Andrew. Andrew's calling from New York City. Hello, Andrew. Silvesa <laughs> Crystal. There it is. How's it going, guys? <laughs> going good, man. How about you? <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like you're having a great time. Good, man, good. Yeah, I think he's had several yeah, already. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's Andrew from last week, but this time I'm sober as a bird today. Uh, I came prepared <laughs> this, this time, though. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, yes, I have I have a, uh, an acknowledgement, a theory, and a question. First of all, speaking of you talking about the original trilogy and this Mantis person being a reference to that, There were actually two references to the cantina in this episode, and I wanted to know if you caught that one as well. Uh, Specifically, that one character, Jason, that you had in the screenshot that was kind of dressed like Han Solo at the bar before they go down to planet Louisiana. It's the (laughs) character that first pops up their head, the first one we see in the cantina in A New Hope when when we hear the band play, and it's that same species as that character. 
that we saw that was sitting at the bar in this episode. Hmm. Oh, okay. Good catch. Me, good catch. Let me pull him up. Yeah, you know, I was I was M- so busy looking at his wardrobe that uh, that I that I missed that because I thought so he's oh, talking he- about the guy, not not the, that guy, or is it? I can't see his head. You- um, yeah, yeah. You know, he's right. He's right. So yeah, when the the cantina scene in in the original Star Wars, you first hear that music and and the same species head pops up. I think his name was yes. M. Dazon. Him, him, Dazon. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, same yeah. V-shaped head and everything. Yeah, cool. V-shaped uh, head. And, yeah. Uh, now, uh, my theory was, um, so you you brought up a good idea how, like, why are they using bounty hunters to find these M count people when you know they had the Inquisitors out looking for the same Force sensitives as well? Yeah. And I'm just thinking, okay, Vader has. The, he has lead of the Inquisitorious. Let's not, uh, you know, and ignore the fact that he has all those younglings and Jedi's in amber, like Jurassic Park in the Inquisitor Tower. But yep. let's keep on going. Mm-hmm. The Emperor is always has his own thing going on. So I'm thinking, Vader sending the Inquisitors. Palpatine is sending the bounty hunters because they have more access and more ability to squeeze people in the criminal underworld. So he's sending them that way because if you look at the timeline, he's probably also trying to tie up loose ends and say, hey, look for force sensitives. But if you see one guy with horns and a black and red face, you shoot him. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know what? You might be onto something about you might be onto something, Andrew, about Vader relying on his inquisitors and Palpatine using these bounty hunters. The bounty hunters are more disposable. They're not going to leave any kind of a paper trail. There's no bureaucracy around these guys. But also the fact that Vader, by the time we get to Empire Strikes Back, he's plumb out of uh, Inquisitors. So, And he's seeing that mm-hmm. Palpatine's had great success in the past with these bounty hunters, so maybe we'll use a bounty hunter. Because I was going to argue with you and say, well, wait yeah. a minute. Based on what we know of Vader... Shouldn't we assume, if anyone's using the bounty hunters in this equation, that it's him? Because we see him do it, going all the way back to Empire. Then I'm thinking maybe he learned something. Yeah, totally. And I'm just thinking, like, you know, maybe around this time is when Maul is starting to build Crimson Dawn, and he's sending the bounty hunters to keep an eye on CB here, and he stirs about the one loose end that escaped that ship that crashed in Mandalore that the body wasn't in the wreckage. Mm. You know? mm-hmm. Um. And my my question to you guys is: Do you think that they? All right. So in the beginning of this episode, they announced how it has poisonous gas, and that's the reason everyone has to keep their helmets on, and she right. has the breathing regulator on. But then later on throughout that episode, there's no callback to it, no reference to it. And do you think maybe that they had a plan for this episode, uh, and they just abandoned it? And lastly, being that we're seven minutes, seven episodes away from the finale of this series. Are you guys kind of fed up with the whole do something for me and you'll get this done kind of episode template that they're still holding on to, even though we're almost reaching the end? Well, let me take your first question. Um, the, yeah. the the fact that the rebreathers or the the breath the breathing masks didn't come back into play and the poison. Um, you know, we know from talking to Dave Filoni many times over the years that uh, there's deleted scenes and scenes that they have intent to fully animate that they don't so that 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 could be something Mm -hmm. that there was a little thread there that they didn't you know didn't pay off because that scene was deleted so you never know um i i will tell you like until you mentioned it i had actually forgotten about the fact that it was the the atmosphere was was poisonous but it's a it's a good it's a good uh, it's a good uh, memory as far as um being frustrated with the pacing of the show or, or the, you know, you got to grab, you got to get this thing and that leads you to the next thing and then leaves you the next thing. It is very video gamey in that way. Like there's these, you know, kind of side, yeah side missions and all of that. Um, I think that if it wasn't for what we were talking about earlier, which is how they're doing these, having these great character moments, like with Crosshair and, and Omega, that it might bother me more. If they were all together, all experiencing this and not kind of on their own journeys, like we're seeing Omega and Crosshair mm-hmm. on their journey. And yes, I think under that those circumstances, it would bother me. But the way it is now, 
it's not. It, it really isn't. Now, if we do get another episode or two where they're not any closer by the end, then I might start to get grumpy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this episode really served just as a vehicle to bring yeah. back the Fennec Shan character at the end of the day. I mean, that's really the only thing that this episode achieved as far as moving the story along, you know, is just bring brought her back a, into the into the story. Right, right. It was just they brought Fennec Shan back. And that was really the only thing we can walk away from this episode saying, well, what did this episode achieve? Well, it brought Fennec Shan back. I, I guess that's it because no information was passed along. Um, all the characters are pretty much in the exact same place they were at the beginning of the episode. Um, Fennec doesn't even have the information they need. Right. So, you know, at the end, it's just it's just one of those mission of the week episodes that doesn't do anything to move the story along. But it's a you know, it's a lot of fun. And and like I said, they brought Fennec Shan back. So, yeah, you at least have the return of a character happening in this episode. But that's really about Jim, it. I think you've convinced me that this was a filler episode. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't I, I really wasn't willing to go there. I wasn't. I wasn't saying that, but you're right. At the end of the episode, do we know much more or do our heroes know much mm -hmm. more than they did before? And the answer is no. They yeah, really nothing don't. really got advanced forward except for the confirmation that there is information that could eventually be passed to the Bad Batch. Right. But um it, it it was you know it's it's kind of a a non-player of an episode you know as, as far as moving the plot forward. Yeah. So it's you know the middle of the season. You almost have to expect that from just about any storytelling that goes on. It will drag it out a little bit. Um and also it it does say something about the durability of this show. And why three seasons is enough mm. is because mm -hmm. because you you'll fall into these ruts, and we've noted them each of the three seasons, where it becomes a mission of the week type of show, and it doesn't there isn't enough happening to really move the story forward. So I think that just tells you that you know they're getting everything they can out of these three seasons. But three seasons is enough when it comes yeah. to the Bad Batch. I see people in the chat saying, well, don't forget about Crosshair. You know, Crosshair's story did move forward. Uh, and it and it did. Um, I would say, what do we know? Well, we can rule out some sort of physical reason for it. An injury, frostbite. You know, <laughs> we were talking about when he was on the ice planet. Right, um, right. This is, they, the, the writers are definitely telling us that this is a psychological um, this is a physical manifestation of a psychological issue or problem. So okay, well, I mean, but that's fine. not you have a time. you have <laughs> a, a little bit of character development that happens, which is fine. But it it doesn't really go. You know, it hasn't gone anywhere in this episode. There was no resolution to the problem. Right, it just drags it on a little bit further. And that that whole story with Crosshair is really just dragging, and um, I I think the only the only next logical step to take is to resolve it. Mm. So we'll see. I mean, yeah. and, and and by the time they resolve it, we'll be like, wow, was it really worth teasing this along for eight episodes? Like thus far, eight episodes. Right. It it needs to have a solid payoff. It, yeah. Yeah. Right. But maybe there's something he does that. Well, I think that's what I think that's going to happen. I th I think that there's going to be a, a a make or break moment for him. He's gonna he's gonna make the shot. He's gonna get the shot. Um, I'll be real honest with you. There are two things that I don't want to happen, and I'll just put it out there. I don't want Tech coming back. I want right. him dead, not because I don't like Tech, but because I think he died a, a meaningful death. It also opened the door for Crosshair to come back. And I don't want Crosshair to die. I'm not mm -hmm. sitting here waiting mm -hmm. for Crosshair to die. Though I will yeah. say, um, 
D Breaker does such obviously a tr tremendous job. This show, this this series is like a virtually a one man show uh, mm -hmm. with D. And I mean, obviously Ang Lee is as as Omega, but uh, Michelle D, Ang. I'm sorry, Michelle Ang, Ang. Lee what did is I say? a director. <laughs> <laughs> I got the Ang part right. Yeah. Um, but uh, with D, but I gotta say that crosshair voice as a hero or as a you know a, a father figure to. Omega is really creeping me out. He's gonna have it's to a like slimy voice. He's gonna yeah. have to dial that back a little bit. I'm hoping <laughs> because it's just so. Yeah, yeah sit next to me. <laughs> it's like Cobra <laughs> Commander uh, just became so a creepy. good guy. Yeah. Or something. <laughs> very true. Very true. Um, uh, I, I yeah. you know, I, I think that uh, Crosshair will end up sacrificing himself. And uh, that's something we've been speculating on uh, for a while. Um, the The idea of, of tech being dead and staying dead is really important to make sure the stakes are maintained and they're high. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's if if a bad batcher can die, then everyone is vulnerable. Yes. And to create great drama, you need to have that vulnerability shared amongst the characters. And the death of tech is something that really emphasizes that, that no one is safe. All right. Guess what? No one is safe from David, Patreon member from Boston. He's home now. And let's, let's see I'm, how the connection I'm is. Back finally. I'm back. Finally. Do we sound good? Just, just let's see what happens. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it, buddy. All right. Well, the nice thing, the nice thing about, I play trivia Wednesday nights. I, I tried to get out earlier to call because when I heard uh, last week you're doing the show in Bristol, I was telling you I have a very special date for that show, which is my mom who took me to see Empire Strikes Back the night it came out. Oh, and you and, and mom are going to see it on the I big screen again in Bristol? Yes, and then well, oh. we had a weekend planned because I'm taking her to see the Neil Diamond Beautiful Noise on Broadway. Great I show. Said, We're going to leave the Fantastic late. show. Because uh, there's this Rebel Force radio thing going on, and we're going to go. You're going to see a podcast, and we're going to go to your Empire Strikes. And so it's going to be awesome. I, I, I tell you but what, I've seen both. I, I, hey, Andrew or David, I've seen both. I've seen. Neil Diamond, A Beautiful Noise on Broadway, and I've seen a live Rebel Force radio show, and uh, it's close, but well, we're better. I, I never have. <laughs> we're we're what better. What I'm wondering so, <laughs> is what it would sound like if Neil well, Diamond guys, sang I've this Pervasive Crystal you. jingle. That's what I'm wondering. Oh, what would Neil sound like if he said, Hello again, Cerveza Crystal. All right. I was that, expecting that, something okay. a little more dynamic, but uh, uh, well, Neil does it. He's not really a shouter, you know. He's a... Yeah, well, sometimes he can, <laughs> you know. They come to America. Ah, grab the old ladies. Grab the old ladies. Sorry, David, I had so to mute you because you were just oh, you were just walking ah. all over our Neil Diamond jokes. But uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I've, I've, I've got you. Well, I've got I you got, open now. I got one thing. It's almost you. like he's. That's doing community service in a in a profoundly uh, good way by, <laughs> by, by trying to tamper down our Neil Diamond jokes. So we're we're so cutting edge. Well, enjoy the show. Yeah. Do we lose it? <laughs> what was that? I tell you what, David. We will see you in Bristol, and there will be no telecom disruptions or anything uh so, sorry it didn't work out try, <laughs> try us next week man let's <laughs> let's see what happens next week okay oh my god uh <laughs> let's do it. somebody in the chat says who had neil diamond impressions on their rfr bingo card for tonight? <laughs> they come Thanks, to america <laughs> Like Max doing the big power uh, tunes, and I'm doing the like soft uh, Neil ballads. <laughs> wow, this was tons of fun. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we don't normally break out the Neil Diamond. Uh, that was uh, just one of those things.
But lots of fun hanging out with everybody tonight, talking about Bad Batch. And this uh, very enjoy, Jim, I think the way you said it was enjoyable. It was a very enjoyable episode. I wasn't watching the the, the clock. I wasn't sitting there going, oh, this is it. I, I've been enjoying it uh, since the first episode of this season. And uh, this week was no exception. But yeah, I'd like a little bit more meat on the bone next week. Let's see if we can get the plot advanced further. Let's Let's hope that our heroes know more at the end of the next episode that they did at the beginning of the episode. Uh, well, I, he- I think that there might be some more profound moments to move the story forward starting next week because we are now, this was the final episode that was given to journalists and reviewers prior to the season starting. Hmm. Those guys got the first eight episodes. So I think they like to walk the reviewers up to a certain point Uh, where they don't have to fear spoilers being released and the bigger things that will move the plot, the big elements that will move the plot forward will start happening now that we're getting into the second half of the season. Yeah. So we're all on a level playing field now. Yes. Yes. I like that. I like that, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I, I like I like being a fellow traveler on this whole journey with everyone that's listening to RFR, and even if we right. had the opportunity, it just wouldn't be something I'd want to want to pursue. But uh, anyway, big thanks to Tyler Page, our call screener. He's been busy all night. We've had some great calls. I mean, except for David, yeah. but I mean, all the other calls. <laughs> All the other calls are great. I don't know what happened to David there at the end, but we know he's going to be in Bristol, and we are go- we're going to finally think of all the anticipation, the suspense that he's built up of what he finally is going to say, what he's going to lay on us. <laughs> when exactly. We're not dealing with uh, <laughs> his cell phone. But that's great. He's going to bring Mom out there. They're going to go see the Neil Diamond show, and then they're going to come and see Live Rebel Force Radio and then relive one of those pivotal childhood moments of mom taking you to see Empire Strikes Back. So, very, very cool. Uh, Tyler, anything that, uh, I think we unpacked it all, but anything that we didn't get to this week? Uh, I think there may be... I I was not thinking that Fennec was doing them wrong. I think she kind of laid the groundwork early on saying, I can connect you with someone. I, I don't think she ever said, like, you know, I can provide this information. I think she held up her end of the bargain pretty well. Because uh, I, I could be wrong on that, but I swear, you know, that's all that the Bad Batch was asking for. Uh, so when she went to talk to whoever she was talking to, I think it's Boba. Uh, mm. I think that was about as, as much as you could get. But, yeah, I mean, for me, this episode, if, if there was a filler episode, it was probably this one. Um, mm-hmm. It didn't feel very satisfying. But... Uh, and also to contrast the light in the darkness of the uh, lighting, I feel like, you know, you have Pabu, that's a super well-lit planet, and then the darkness of the outside world. So maybe they're just going for an artistic thing there. But uh, yeah, I do want to actually see the planets we're exploring. So uh, yeah, it would be not nice. all. Yeah. Well, we <laughs> yeah. got to see it in daylight, but uh, anyway. Well, Tyler, as I always say, we couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much. You really do add a lot uh, to the program each and every week, screening those calls, and uh, people look forward to seeing the beard every yeah. week. As always. Oh, as a matter of fact, Jeff Holland in the chat said that, uh, and you put this on the screen, um, beard is approaching ZZ Topness. <laughs> ZZ Topness. So, so that means uh, Tyler is bad batch. He's nationwide. <laughs> ZZ Top fans will know what I mean when I say that. He's Bad Badge. He's nationwide. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Tyler. Appreciate it, buddy. Thanks, we'll Ed. see. We'll catch up with you next week. Uh, Jimmy Mac, final thoughts, Bad Batch, episode eight. We're halfway through. Lay it on us. Wow. That, yeah, I guess, I guess we're e- even more past uh, the halfway point. I think it's a 15-episode season, if I'm... Or maybe it's 16. I'm not 15. sure. But yeah, it's 15. It is, oh, it is 15. Half, yeah. So we're just a little bit beyond halfway. And I really think the story is going to 
ramp up quite a bit starting uh, as soon as next week. Um, there was a callback in this episode to the Hexion Brood bosses that Siler Saris killed, stole from. And uh, the Hexion Brood, uh, they appear in the game uh, Jedi Fallen Order and Jedi Survivor. Uh, Cal Kestis runs across <laughs> some bounty hunters that work for the Hexion Brood. So I knew I recognized that name right when I heard it. And I, I think they made a reference to them in um, the other Fennec Shand, uh, the first Fennec Shand episode of The Bad Batch from season one. Um, I, I think they make a reference to them in that. They also make a reference to um, another season one episode, uh, episode nine, Bounty Lost, when uh, Fennec reveals to The Bad Batch she didn't let Omega go. But her client thought Omega would be safer with the Bad Batch. And so I wanted to look up the actual dialogue from when that all happened. And um, what had happened was the uh, 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 in that episode, Fennec was in her ship and she had a hologram communication with Nala Say, who was the actual client. And it's revealed that Nala Se had hired Fennec Shan to go out and find Omega. And she couldn't deliver Omega back because Omega was with the Bad Batch. And Nala Se said, as long as she's not in the hands of Lama Su, she is safe. So that was the moment when uh, Fennec stopped her pursuit of Omega in season one of Bad Batch. And it's also revealed that it was Nala Se who was the client. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, also, uh, there's a line where uh, <laughs> Fennec reminds me of everyone's favorite character from the Star Wars sequel trilogy, DJ. <laughs> Remember DJ? <laughs> that stuttering Benicio Del Toro character from <laughs> The Last Jedi? Fennec says, you know, she says, good guys, bad guys, their money is all the same. And um, that's very similar to what DJ says when mm -hmm. he's breaking down uh, these arms dealers. He's talking about these arms dealers. You know, they sell to the uh, First Order. They sell to the Resistance. Good guys, bad guys, it's all the same. So uh, that's uh, DJ. Don't uh, anticipate having another moment to reference DJ on <laughs> Rebel Force Radio for several years to come after this. So, <laughs> so all you DJ fans, enjoy it while it lasts. I thought it was really kind of a ridiculous thing to have Fennec disable the boat. She clipped those wires when Siler would try to steal it. I thought that was kind of ridiculous. I mean, why doesn't she just stay there and guard the boat? If she knows Siler is going to go for it, then she could easily ambush him, as opposed to disabling the boat. That seemed to be a real stretch to me. She was so certain Siler would eventually break away from the Bad Batch and try to steal the boat, so Fennec completely disables the boat. I don't know. I think she could have played that a little bit better. Um, and I also thought it was cool that Siler could spit green acid when uh, I couldn't <laughs> see it. He's in a. <laughs> it was hard to see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was acid, and I, I it was green according to the descriptive audio track. Um, oh, that's well, that's the, the secret weapon against this darkness. Is we listen to the <laughs> the descriptive audio that's right. track. Brilliant. That's right. Yes, uh, that really. Uh, <laughs> helps explain what's going on to those who can't see it. And um, unfortunately, that's about 99% uh, of the people watching this show. You can't see nothing. Um, so all in all, I, you know, it was a fun episode. It, it was good. It was, you know, um, and it was over before you knew it. I, I'm getting that feeling with a lot of Bad Batch episodes this season. It feels like I'm just getting settled in and the credits start rolling. So that's either a sign of um, a show that, you know, might want to, you know, 
give us a little bit longer running times to uh, help put more meat on the bones, or it's just a sign it's a, a good show and a good time, and, and time travels, you know, flies by quickly when you're having fun. So uh, I had a lot of fun with this episode. Puff a pig, not in this episode. <laughs> All right, well, that'll wrap things up for us. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, thank you. Big, big shout out to everybody that is is here regularly in the chat. You guys really, really help keep the synergy and the momentum going of our after shows. We really appreciate it. And um, also the new folks dropping by. Always great to have you. So if you're listening to this on Delayed Podcast, that's great. But if you can join us for one of the live shows, it's a heck of a lot of fun. We'd love to hear from you, whether it be the, uh, through the chat or through the phone calls. Um, make a point if you can. We've only got a few more weeks together. I, we, I know there's a, I think there's another double feature coming up, uh, at least one more double feature. So we might only have about uh, six weeks back together here on the Bad Batch After Show. And that's until the next show, which we know is going to be the Acolyte in June. So it won't be too long of a break for us. And we'll be back with all of that. But we will be back for the Rebel Force Radio weekly podcast. So make sure that you are subscribed and you can download that when it comes out this Saturday. Uh, But uh, for more Bad Batch, come back here next week, Wednesday night, 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time on YouTube. We'll be here. Will you? I hope so. For Rebel Force Radio, we'll see you next time. I'm Jason. I'm Jimmy Mack. And remember... Force will be with you always. <laughs>